Okay, thanks, Rubens. Uh, thank, thank, thank you all who logged in. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, this is actually the first time we present these results to, to an audience of economists. So we will be very happy to hear your comments and suggestions and to see if you find this as interesting as we did. So let me start with some broad motivation on artificial intelligence and its effects on labor markets. But we all know that like artificial... Ah, I don't know they share screen, sorry. Just a second. Desculpa, gente, não sei o que tá acontecendo aqui com o Zoom. Pronto, vai dar certo. E agora? Tudo yeah. certo? Everything okay? Okay, I'm sorry. So let me start with some broad motivation on artificial intelligence and on its effects on, on labor markets. We all know that artificial intelligence shifted the limits of which tasks can be automated. Uh, and in doing so, it uh, largely relocated tasks between human labor and technology. But perhaps because artificial and human intelligence are seen as imperfect substitutes on uh, production function, on production functions, uh, this also revived a debate on what should be uh, and what should not be automated. Uh, in education, this controversy uh, has surrounded the topic of uh, the use of automated write writing evaluation systems. At their core, these systems use natural language processi processing to extract uh, features that are related to essay quality. And they also use machine learning algorithms to generate scores and allocate feedback based on the features that are extracted by the NLP. The supporters of uh, AWE uh, highlight that, they, that these systems may relax teacher time constraints and allow teachers to use more time in tasks that will not and cannot be perfectly automated. Uh, they also tend to highlight that these systems may help circumvent teachers' human capital constraints, which will be even more important in developing country cont contexts such as ours. The critics, however, argue that artificial intelligence is, per definition, blind to the meaning of texts, and uh, in this sense that it cannot emulate human parsing, grading, and feedback behavior. Uh, so we believe that this controversy largely bypasses uh, the most, one of the most interesting questions from an economics and a policy perspective, which is uh, whether these technologies uh, can affect learning after being incorporated into instruction. So this is where we come in. We study uh, two educational technologies or ed techs that were designed to improve uh, scores in the argumentative essay of the national secondary education exams, exam, the ANA. Uh, both ed techs uh, were designed uh, and uh, were, were, were designed to be focused on uh, learning among public school, high, uh, public school seniors. Interestingly, these ad techs use different combinations of artificial and human intelligence. So the first ad tech, which we'll call the pure AWE, uh, uses only the artificial intelligence to provide grades and feedback. Uh, since, it use, since this ad tech uses only the AI, it can, do, uh, it can do this uh, instantaneously. Uh, the second ad tech, which we will call the enhanced AWE, uh, uses the AI, uh, uh, passes on the, the AI grades and feedback to human graders who supervise these grades and feedback and submit a full grading uh, with a lag of three days. So, uh, let me provide a, a little bit more of background on the National Secondary Education Exam. I believe that most of the audience is, uh, is uh, made of Brazilians, but I would be happy to discuss the importance of NA with anyone who's not from Brazil. But uh, NA is a key determinant of access to post-secondary education in Brazil, 
just to give uh, an idea of its size, uh, 5 million people or and 70% of the total of high school seniors in Brazil uh, enrolled in NA in the year of our study. One of the interesting features of the of the uh, of scores in the NA exam is that the private school premium is uh, much larger in the uh, in the essay than in the multiple choice multiple choice test scores. So uh, as we can see in this figure, it is approximately two times the gap in the larger uh, in the larger. Uh, it, it is about two times the size of the largest premium in multiple choice test scores, which is the one in mathematics. So, uh, to, so this highlights the importance of uh, our of our study, because these both both ed techs, despite large differences in functioning and costs, both ed techs could make public school students more competitive for post secondary education admission. So. Uh, so this, this uh, slide uh, tries to uh, provide background on, on how these, uh, the, the students' essays are graded by the official ending graders. So for instance, in 2019, as is standard in the NA exam, the topic of, of the essay was a social issue, broadly defined. So in 2019, the, this topic was the democratization of access to cinema in Brazil. The first set of skills that uh, graders value is uh, what, we call, what we call in the paper synthetic skills. So here the graders look at the ability of students to, to use the formal written norm of written Portuguese, of, of Portuguese, and to build a text that is fluid both within and across paragraphs uh, following using argumentative uh, connectives. The second set of skills is what we call in the paper analytical and uh, here, uh, students are evaluated in terms of their ability to interpret and use the information from the motivating elements of the essay and uh, their ability to mobilize concepts from several er areas of knowledge uh, that were acquired through the schooling process. Uh, most interestingly, and this is uh, specific from a name, uh, the, a final set of skills that is evaluated is the so-called policy proposal. So students are, are, are uh, required to, to propose an intervention that is consistent with the thesis developed in the essay concerning the social issue at hand. And if you look at the private school premium uh, now within these sets of skills, we see that uh, the gap, the public uh, the, the private public school gap uh, is increasing in the complexity of the writing skill. Uh, so uh, just a little bit more of information on our, on our experiment. Uh, it, we designed and implemented a field experiment in Espírito Santo in Brazil. Uh, Brazil. Uh, it happened in 2019. Uh, we randomized 178 schools into three treatment arms. So 55 schools to the pure AWE arm, 55 schools to the enhanced AWE arm, and the, the remaining 68 schools were uh, formed the control group. At baseline, we observed approximately 19,000 students. Uh, so we observed high and very similar levels of compliance with, with the treatment in each of the five writing activities that, uh, that were part of the ed tech programs. Uh, among teachers, more than 95 assigned essays through the platform, and uh, these assignment behavior did not change throughout the year. Among students, uh, 75 to 80 percent submitted essays through the platform, and if we perform statistical tests, we cannot reject the null that uh, the general compliance between teachers and students was equal in both treatment arms, despite the large differences in the ad text. So let me now move to our main results. Uh, this graph plots the ITT estimates of both ad techs. Uh, the full circles are for the enhanced AWE and the, the hollowed circles are for the pure AWE ad tech. So the first main result is that uh, both ad techs had positive and very similar impacts on the name writing scores if we consider the full score. 
Uh, these effects were channeled by improvements in each set of skills considered separately. And we, and interestingly, uh, the largest effects are found for the most sophisticated skill, the policy proposal. If we look at the p-values uh, below the, 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 the estimates, uh, we cannot reject the null in any, for, in either in the full score or, for, or in the sets of, of skills, uh, that the ITTs are equal between treatment arms. Uh, regarding mechanisms, we collected primary data to investigate three issues. First of all, we were interested in uh, whether the technologies would increase the amount of training for the NASA. And we find, uh, if you look at the leftmost uh, plot, uh, leftmost coefficients in the, in the figure, we find that both ad techs were able to uh, increase, uh, increase the number of written essays by 25 to 30 percent. Uh, we are able to reject um, increases of less than 20 percent in this case, and we cannot reject the null that this, this increases, that these improvements in training were equal across treatment arms. We also looked at um, feedback, uh, either in the form of annotations or in the form of grades, and we observed similar and high uh, increases in those margins. Um, and most interestingly, we see uh, that teachers um, that teachers in the in the treatment arms were more likely to engage in personal discussions with teachers on their essay quality. So uh, we find that teachers did not completely delegate tasks to the ed techs, and uh, and that the ed techs somehow allowed them to put more time in tasks that cannot be automated. So tasks that are non-routine in essence, uh, such as interpreting uh, the essay after, after receiving the, grade, the feedback and interacting with students about their essay, about their essay writing abilities. Uh, we also looked at um, effects on a range of secondary outcomes. Uh, we were interested in, um, in effects on um, other writing skills, or more specifically on skills that uh, would appear in another textual genre. So we collected primary uh, data on students uh, on stu on a, uh, using a biography, so a narrative essay, not an argumentative essay. Uh, we find no evidence of positive or negative effects. So positive effects would be consistent with uh, spillovers between skills that are transportable across genres and negative effects would be consistent with training to the test and becoming unable to write an essay in, or less able to, to write a good essay in another te textual genre. We find evidence that the ad text had no positive or, or negative effects on this margin. And uh, we, we, using the, the scores uh, in a name uh, and in the state's standardized exam, we also find evidence that the ad text did not uh, affect scores in language related and in non-language related um, topics. So, and notice that because we, we pull this data, uh, we get quite precise estimates. We can rule out positive or negative effects of more than half a standard deviation on this margin. So let me end up with some final remarks, taking stock of what we learned with this intervention, uh, with this study. Well, both ed techs had positive effects on writing scores and the additional input from human graders, graders, albeit costly, did not improve eff effectiveness either in the full score or in the scores that capture very different writing skills and add up to the full score. Uh, most interestingly, we find positive effects even, even in skills that AI arguably would fall short in evaluating, such as the most complex skills valued in the exam. Uh, and we find that the ad techs similarly supported the engagement of teachers on non-routine tasks that uh, are at the core of a pedagogy that is uh, individualized and that contemplates students' heterogeneity. So uh, we, uh, so this this is the the, the final slide, and uh, I'm going to talk a little about about how we view our contributions. Uh, the contributions map quite naturally in the comparisons between treatment arms in the experiment. So the comparison between the pure AWE 
EdTech and the control uh, provides the first impact evaluation. And I'm not talking only about developing countries that relies on a large sample and a credible research design. Uh, I would be happy to discuss the limitations of the literature on this topic with anyone that's interested. Uh, second, the comparison between the enhanced AWE and EdTech and the control group uh, is an efficacy trial of an EdTech that uh, was tailored by the implementer to overcome several, uh, to overcome two very important bottlenecks of pedagogy in public schools, which are human capital and time constraints. Uh, so given that they have a very uh, rich view of these constraints, it was surprising to us that there was no added value of human graders. Uh, from a policy perspective, this is a very important result because uh, human graders are costly uh, because uh, employing human graders is costly either because you have to pay them or because you have to monitor their, their work continuously. So thank you very much. I hope I have not exceeded the time. Um, no, right? You still have three minutes. Uh, almost four minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Out of the Paula. Any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. If... Hi, Audio. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> so, so if I understand correctly, especially the second bullet point in your final slide. Uh, refers to some notion of substitutability between the tech and humans. Uh, I'm not sure if the graders are dedicated graders or teachers themselves, but other results in your presentation also suggest that there is some complementarity between the technology and the teachers engaging more with the students. Uh, so we seem to have found evidence of that, which is interesting per se, because when people talk about AI, we typically have this image of the robots coming to replace humans, whereas yeah. it seems that they're working together with the teachers. I mean, they're improving the they're they're improving the the feedback that the students get, but also uh, somehow incentivizing the input that comes from the teachers. If I understand correctly, yeah, yeah, that's how we interpret the evidence uh, on substitution and complementarity. We we uh, are taking a little bit of care uh, about using these concepts because we would need a design, uh, a more complex design where some schools have access to the technology and some schools have access to the technology and we randomize the amount of, of this use. Uh, so we, view, we think this is consistent with, uh, as you said, human graders substituting uh, and uh, substituting the, 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 the edX, uh, the, the AI, I'm sorry, and uh, with teachers and the ad techs being complementary, but yeah. we're not using this. Because concept. I mean, the, the teachers um, will also optimally, quote unquote, respond to the tech themselves. And the question is whether they're gonna withdraw input or introduce more quality input. That would be very interesting to pursue, but I, I'm not gonna take any more of the, the remaining time. Thank you. Thank you, Audio. Thank you very much. Nick. Hello, Flavio. Uh, I have one doubt about, it's not exactly a doubt, but it's a question with regards to how do you interpret the results in light of possible mechanisms? Uh, it's in my understanding there are no effects for other writing abilities, and rather only for the NA, uh, the NA text. So I'm thinking about, well, how do you interpret that? Because yeah, it, 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 and also if you have tried to measure anything related with motivation or uh, emotional skills, uh, emotional skills with regards to having a test. So that's my doubt. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I, I can't see who, who's speaking. What's your name? My name is Enrique. Sorry if oh no, uh, <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Enrique. Thanks. That's a very that's a very good question. Um, so, so uh, some I should have explained this a little bit better. But some writing skills uh, are the same between the two textual genres. So the synthetic skills, uh, which uh, so basically writing correctly, uh, would 
be transportable across the skills. So the fact that we do not do not find evidence of of effects uh, on on these writing skills, um, yeah, yeah, we, we would have we would need to to look. I can I can talk about this a little bit more with you later. But we looked at the effects on skills that are transportable between genres and the ones that aren't. And so this provides a little bit more of insight about why, about how to interpret these results. And uh, on motivation, we, we try to address this by looking at uh, other secondary outcomes because uh, uh, one story that would be consistent with increases in motivation to, to, uh, for the NA assay would be improvements uh, in other scores that are evaluated by NA, correct? And uh, we do not find evidence that uh, that this happened. This is also consistent with a result that I did not present, but the ad text did not make students more willing, uh, more likely to, to, more willing to be in post-secondary education in the next year. So motivation does not seem to be playing a large role in these results. But I would be happy to, to talk to you a little bit Sorry, more so, about so um, so they're just so they're just uh, so you this 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 procedure only help them own an NA assays. In, in fact, you don't see any results uh, outside of, of of that scope. It's only yeah. for NA that, that yeah. things are are being really relevant. Yeah. yeah, only only scores in the NA assay were were responsive to the to the ad text. This is the basic takeaway. Um, but thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, Bruno or Tony, if you if your question is really quick because we have like two minutes. Uh, okay. Well, I'm sorry, I'm still with the background from unpacking here, but uh, well, congratulations, Flavio, on your uh, presentation. It was really nice. I had two questions, and well, I'm only going to ask one of them. Um, okay. Could you talk a little bit more about just because of time constraints? But um, could you talk a little bit more about your data? How did you, because what I understood is that you had the experiment and then you found the people in NA, right? You, the grades you're using are from how, how these students performed in NA, is that it? And how did you find them? Yeah, so uh, the randomization used clusters. Uh, we randomized schools and the NA micro data identifies uh, students by, by their, uh, their, the NAP code of each school. So we did not, I don't know if I understand the, the question correctly, but we did not uh, uniquely identify students in DNA microdata, and we did not. Uh, ha we didn't. This wasn't necessary to do the evaluation. One thing that I did not discuss carefully is uh, that we also collected primary data. We also collected primary data on an DNA assay. So uh, the 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 estimates on on NA assay scores. Uh, pull the data from the official NA assay and the data from this primary from this primary data we collected with the educational authority of the state. Uh, so I don't know if this answers your question, but this yeah, is yeah, it answers. So you our, ma our, our main data right. set pulls our main data set pulls data from from NA the official NA assay and a, a, a primary data on a non-official NA assay we collected. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would be happy to answer your second question if you send yeah, if me there's a time. chat or, yeah. Yeah, it was more about interpretation. How do you interpret your results given that, I mean, you didn't find much of a difference between the, the enhanced uh, AI and the pure AI? I mean, because is this related to the quality of the AI that you're using? I mean, how do you interpret this? Because you would expect Usually AI is not that good on feedback with respect to texts, you know, and written exams from what yeah. I know. So, how, so how, how much is, do you think this maybe is like an evaluation of the quality of the specific AI you used in your uh, exam? Or, yeah, or so this is not, uh, thank you. This is, a, this is a problem. We don't uh, have time? No, we don't have time. If you can answer okay. to text or for the so, chat. Okay, who's, who's talking? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name here. It's My name is Bruno. Uh, Bruno Tony. Oh, Bruno, Bruno. Okay, okay. Thanks, Bruno. I'll answer it in the chat, okay? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much.
Okay, so now it's Marcela. Okay, um, sorry. okay uh, can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I'm gonna present my work with my co-author, uh, Julia Buccioni, who's here in the audience. So uh, the Pentecostal church is one of the, rest, the fastest growing uh, religious movement in the world. Uh, Two important characteristics of this religion is their intense use of media and that they are more conservative than other Christian, Christian faiths. Uh, although they have been growing a lot, there is still very little evidence on the socioeconomic causes and conse consequences of their expansion. So in this paper, we address two questions. The first is to understand what is the effect of religious media on religious affiliation. And then we, we try to understand uh, wh uh, what is the, if, if religious media can also affect behaviors in a way that is consistent with the church's prescription. To do so, we exploit the expansion of Record TV and we look first at religious affiliation and then uh, we check whether people start behaving um, consistent with the church's prescription and in particular, we focus on fertility, uh, labor force participation, voting, and crime. The idea of looking at crime is that um, many of the values of the church is pro familia and says that you can drink or gambling, so people are less likely engaging in risky behavior, so that could affect crime. So Record TV was a secular TV channel, and in the 80s, it went bankrupt. And in 1990, it was bought by Edir Macedo and it started broadcasting uh, religious content. To give you an idea of how much religious content, uh, one study estimates that uh, Record TV uh, broadcasts 60 hours of religious content per week, while the other leading two TV channels were broadcasting around one hour and 12 minutes of religious content. So it's uh, uh, a significant difference. So this graph shows the expansion of Record TV uh, across, uh, on, over, across Brazilian municipalities over time. So see here that in the beginning of the 80s, uh, they covered very little uh, municipalities, only 10%. And then in the 90s, they already covered around 30%. But over the 90s, that was, there was a huge expansion. And by 2000, they covered uh, more than half of the Brazilian municipalities. We focus our study in the spirit of the 90s. Uh, we use five main sources of data. First, we use three uh, waves of the Brazilian census, which gives us for each individual their religious affiliation, uh, fertility, labor force participation, and demographic characteristics. Then we use data, data from Anatel, which gives us uh, the technical characteristics of transmitters, their precise location, the date of installation, and the owner. We, for our analysis, we select only the transmitters that are owned by Record TV. Uh, for our voting outcomes, we use data from the Federal Electoral Authority, which gives us uh, information on candidates' profiles, so we know their name, the campaign alias, age, gender, and we also know the number of votes that each candidate receiving, received in each municipality. Then for our crime data, we use uh, the number of deaths by external causes. And finally, we use data from the Brazilian, Brazilian RIS. And from, from this data, we, we know exactly the number of Pentecostal churches in each municipality in each year. So using data from, from Anatel, we can compute the signal, the signal strength uh, from each transmitter to each receiving location in each year. So for each municipality, we take the maximum value of the signal strength for each year. We compute two types of, of signal strength. The first is what we call the signal in the free space, which is a function of the power of the transmitter and the distance between the transmitter and the receiving location. Then we compute compute also the 
actual signal strength, which also takes into account the geomorphological characteristics. So it takes into account if there was, for instance, a mountain that can block uh, the signal, or if there's some vegetation, or something that could diffract the signal. Uh, this actual signal is a very strong predictor, predictor of actual audience, and has been largely used in the literature. In our main peer request strategy, we regress our outcome of interest on the signal strength, uh, the signal in the first space, on individual and municipality characteristics that change over time, uh, municipality fixed effects, and uh, state year fixed effects to allow for state specific shocks. And we cluster our, our standard errors at the municipality level. So our parameter of interest is gamma one. So uh, our identification comes from the installation of new transmitters over time. So the idea here is that we compare the evolution of places in which there was an increase in the signal strength with uh, places with the evolution of places in, in which the signal didn't increase. And uh, we also, uh, the idea here of controlling for the signal in, in the free space uh, is that it's possible that some, that places that are closer to the transmitters have trends different from places that are farther away. Like for instance, it's possible that uh, Hecord TV uh, installed the transmitters in places that are growing faster. If it is the case, then uh, this trend will be picked up by the by the signal in the first place. So to be clear, the signal in the first place is picking up trends that are related to the distance uh, to the transmitter, but are not the actual coverage. So uh, our coefficient of interest is identified net of uh, of uh, changes in the distance to the transmitter. Uh, so, in our main results here, uh, in column one, we look at the fact of, uh, of the actual signal on the share of Pentecostals, and here we are not controlling for the signal in the free space, neither for individuals or municipality controls, and we had only uh, time fixed effects, but not uh, state time zero fixed effects, and we see that uh, an increase uh, here, the signal is uh, standardized, so it's uh, in it's one standard deviation in the signal strength, leads to an increase in the share of Pentecostals. Then in column two, we add the, as a control, the signal in the free space and individual and municipality uh, controls, and we see a similar result. And then finally, in, in column three, we also control for state year fixed effects. And again, we see a similar result. Uh, in column four, uh, we do a falsification test. So we do the same analysis, but the for the period before record being religious, religiously affiliated, so for the AIDS. And here we don't see an effect. So an increase in the signal around this period didn't increase the share of Pentecostals. And finally, we look at the effect for Catholics and Protestants. So we see a, a negative effect for Catholics and no effect for Protestants. This is consistent with the sociolo sociology literature that says that uh, most of the Pentecostals are former Catholics, but not former uh, Protestants, which uh, didn't change much over time. So uh, one limitation of the census data is that we only have data every 10 years. So it's possible that uh, Pentecostals increased before the signal. So uh, the share of Pentecostals would predate the installation of the signals. So we use data uh, on the number of churches which is yearly data, to give some evidence that this is not happening. So we construct uh, an event study in which uh, the x-axis is uh, when a municipality started being covered by record TV. So in time zero, it's when the municipality gets a signal that is strong enough to ensure uh, viewership. And we see that there is a positive increase in the, in the, in the number of Pentecostal church around this period, and we don't see any difference uh, in the for for the periods in which the municipality was not covered by record TV. Uh, we conduct several robustness checks. Uh, the first one we look at selection, 
So uh, the idea here is to see whether our outcome is actually triggering uh, the treatment. It, if it's an increase in if, whether uh, the transmitters are being placed uh, according to the share of Pentecostals 1991. We don't find any evidence of that. Then uh, next, we use an alternative empirical strategy. So we use an IV strategy in which we, we instrument the signal in 2000 by the signal before um, record being religious affiliated. So the idea here is to use only the variation come from uh, the transmitters uh, installed using only the variation from, from transmitters installed before uh, record being uh, religious affiliated. So the idea here is that the placement of these transmitters was not done based on any religious ambition of record TV. Here we found a similar effect. So the fact uh, using this alternative strategy, we find a, a, a similar effect compared to the other strategy. Then to ensure that, that uh, our results are coming from actual exposure to record TV and not from unobservable characteristics correlated to the signal strength, we control for the signal in the future, so in the next year. So uh, the hypothesis for this exercise is that if you control for the exposure to record TV in year T, then uh, when we add uh, then uh, exposure in, in the year T plus one does not predict our outcome. And we find that um, we find that uh, the coefficient for the signal in the future is indeed it's zero and is statistically different from the current signal. Uh, next, uh, because uh, uh, big cities might be the target of, of the placement of the transmitters because then they can reach more population per transmitters. And then this place might have trends that are different from smaller municipalities. We draw from that analysis and we find similar results. Similarly, we draw from our analysis places where uh, municipalities where the transmitter was located, located and surrounding municipalities. And again, we find the same results. And next, we compare municipalities that are close to each other so that they share similar uh, labor markets and they're, they are susceptible to similar uh, local shocks and the places that are also very similar uh, in terms of, of signal in the free space. So they are at a very, at a, they are at the same distance from the transmitters. And then we, we do the analysis in this municipality and we see again that an increase in the, in, the, in the signal of record TV leads to an increase in the share of Pentecostals. Uh, now I'm going to show the results for, for behaviors. Uh, first, let's look at fertility. So we see here that an increase in the signal strength leads to an increase in fertility. These uh, results make sense because uh, the Pentecostal Church promotes uh, the, family, the values of the family, so that people should, should try to build a family, to get married, and also they don't encourage women to study much, and they also says that women should stay at home while the men work. And so consistent with this story, we found a negative impact for female labor force participation and a positive impact for male labor force participation. This is consistent with the man being the breadwinner of the house and the woman staying at home, taking care of the husband and the kids. Next, we find a negative impact for home science rate. And finally, for the share of votes, uh, for, uh, we find a positive impact for, uh, for Pentecostal candidates and uh, a negative impact for Catholic candidates. So uh, our data on fertility has the advantage that we can actually construct a larger panel. So for each woman, we know how many kids she has, we know the age of, of each kid, so we can retrieve the year of birth of each kid. So in a similar fashion, we construct a event study and we show that, uh, that the, chance, the, the probability of giving birth after being covered by record TV, it's 
uh, increases and we don't see much going on here and these coefficients are, are uh, they are not jointly significant. And well, this is what I have. I can go um, in more detail on the robustness text, but I think I would be happy to take your questions now since I have five minutes. And thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Marcelo, for your presentation. Uh, I was thinking about uh, mechanisms, especially uh, because if record is, is the real deal here and, and television is important, maybe we should expect substitutability and complementarity of record with other types of media. So have you seen if the effects are higher or stronger with radio uh, internet presence or if they are lower and also uh, I don't know if that's a general feeling of the audience but I have a feeling that uh, to me it wasn't very clear why controlling for sino free or uh, something like that the variable was called like that uh, would, would make your identification better so if you could re-explain that I would be very grateful. Okay uh, thank you uh, so we didn't check for other, other kinds of media uh, we know that TV is a very strong type of media. Internet was not widely spread at this time. So I think people didn't have uh, computers at their, at their place at this time, like with the internet and so on. But indeed, uh, radio could be something. It could be something important. And uh, so for, for the signal in the free space, the idea is to control for, for the distance to 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 uh, to places that are more central, like if record TV uh, places their transmitters in places that are going faster, that are wealthy, then our outcomes could be our effect could be coming from not the signal, but for the fact that they are closer to this this municipality. So the effect that we are picking up would be picking up is not related to the signal, but would be instead related to the fact that they are closer to these spots. As like we control for distance, we can also think about the, the signal in the first place as just the distance through the transmitter. Then we are we are controlling for for that. So we ensure that our like not really ensure completely, but we have more confidence that our effect is coming from the the actual signal and not because uh, these places are closer to central areas, places that are getting richer or growing faster. I don't know if this help it. There, there's a question from Tiago. He asks, how do you identify Pentecostal and Catholic candidates? Oh, so I follow a paper by Costa, uh, Rocha and all. Like from Huji and, and Chico. And uh, we use, we identify when they disclose, disclosure, disclose their occupation. So if in the name, uh, in the campaign alias, if the person says a uh, pastor, something or something related to, to the church, like if you're a priest, if you're a pastor, uh, if you're a minister, something like that. We, uh, uh, to classify like that, we followed other studies that did the same. I have a question. Yes. Uh, there's a paper from La Ferrara. Uh, first, uh, congratulations, it's a very nice paper. Uh, but there's a paper from La Ferrara on the impact of global TV soap operas yes. on fertility right. here in Brazil. So could this result affect your estimate on fertility? So um, I think it's a bit unlikely because um, first of all, she looks at the effect on um, much on the seventies, I guess. And when the families were very big and then they look at the TV and they mimic their behavior. So our results are actually coming in an opposite trend than hers because she found a decrease in the fertility rate. So when you watch TV Globe, the novellas, uh, families tend to have less kids. And, and here we found exactly the opposite, that uh, 
that being exposed to record TV could increase, uh, increase fertility. So if there is any interaction with her effect, I think this is more likely to, to, for us to be underestimating our effects. No further questions. I have like one minute, two minutes maybe. Okay, so thank you, Marcela. Thank you. Danielle, can go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to present at SP. Uh, so this paper is about the effects of uh, job training programs. It's a joint work with Rodrigo Oliveira and Diana Silva, uh, who are both here uh, with us. Um, so uh, governments uh, around the world have been implementing uh, policies to tackle persistent unemployment. Uh, improve skills and labor market outcomes of workers. Uh, those policies, uh, the retu returns of those policies vary hugely and may be influenced by the business cycle. So it's uh, really important to understand uh, what policies work in uh, which context. So in this paper, we're gonna focus on one specific type of uh, policy, uh, vocational training programs. Okay, uh, vocational training uh, courses, they aim to improve matching between firm demand and workers uh, to ease transition from education to work. Uh, uh, to be precise, uh, those uh, training programs, vocational training programs can be provided by uh, the private sector with and without subsidies or, by, or directly by the public sector. In this context that we study here in Brazil, is a training program uh, directly provided by the public sector. Okay, uh, as uh, we will explain a little bit later in two slides, it's a long duration intensive uh, vocational training program. Okay, so we uh, investigate the effects on uh, post course uh, placement decisions. Okay, namely, uh, whether you're gonna be a worker, uh, you're gonna set up a firm or you're gonna continue your studies in a given university, okay? An important feature of this program is that admission is through lotteries. And we were able to, to get data of uh, 200,000 applicants and 15,000 uh, winners and the national ID of each one of, of the applicant. So we are able to follow uh, because of the national ID, we are able to follow the applicants in different registries. So this is how we collect our outcome variables. And uh, those applicants, uh, they belong to uh, basically two cohorts and they have graduated at different moments of the business cycle, okay? And then we assess uh, the impact on employment of female students, male students, and we, we, we find that regardless of the moment of the business cycle, female students, uh, they perform better in terms of employment compared to the male students. So this is the main uh, result of the paper. And we show that the returns of the program are higher when students, they graduate before a recession and not during a recession. We do not find any impact on earnings. Okay, we perform uh, some heterogeneity analysis, uh, and we find that the positive impacts on employment are driven by uh, students uh, graduating in services, okay, courses, vocational courses in services, and when they graduate in locations, local economies, economies that are faster growing in terms of local GDP. When we assess the impact of the program, on uh, setting up a firm, that is on being an entrepreneur or in reverse admission, we don't find any impact, okay? 
Uh, so this is the, you know, the summary of the paper because of time constraints, I'm sure I will be unable to detail every single part. So that's why I'm giving uh, upfront this broader picture of the paper. Uh, just to emphasize our setting, uh, we are talking about uh, one state in Brazil, Bahia state, uh, where the public sector uh, uh, provides what we call a high dosage program. Why do you call, why we call it a high dosage program? Because it has different features, okay? That's quite unique in the literature. We have one semester, the course uh, lasts two years. Every course lasts two years. Uh, one semester is of basic training, like Portuguese, math, okay? Uh, you have two semesters of uh, uh, class training of specific uh, subjects for, you know, the occupation of the vocational training course. So it's more focused on the occupation. And then you have a six month, uh, plus six months of uh, internship. So it's a combined uh, two years uh, and it's a very, uh, it's on the high end of duration when we, we compare to the literature on training. Um, uh, I will not discuss the literature, but basically our contribution is that we uh, for, you, uh, compare to papers with a similar research design. We are assessing long-term effects. Uh, we are assessing also uh, different uh, placement decisions, okay? Uh, not only uh, labor uh, employment uh, in, a, in, in a formal firm. And because we have a large scale program we use uh, this information, this uh, feature to perform heterogeneity analysis not yet done by the literature. Uh, so uh, I will now detail a little bit the program. Uh, it's called PROSUBI, uh, whose goal is to uh, provide, you know, these technical skills to uh, tackle high unemployment in, in the Bahia state. Uh, of course, I think all, all of you know by a state, but it's a, a large state in Brazil whose territory is larger than France, for instance. And you know, the, the government, the state government uh, runs the program uh, uh, in different, uh, you know, local uh, in, uh, training institutes in 50 municipalities, okay? Uh, and the, you know, with a huge variety of uh, courses in agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Uh, to apply for a position at the program is free. If you enroll in the program is free, tuition, okay, is free throughout the entire course. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, some courses have uh, low demand, some of them very high demand, okay. Uh, and as I said before, it's a very intensive, long duration course and mixed uh, basic, basic education, vocational education and internship. Everyone from the Bahia State who finished a public school are eligible to apply for a position as a student at the vocational training, regardless of age, uh, employment history and other characteristics. Okay, so this also explain the high demand for uh, most of the courses. And this is, this, is, uh, this is Bahia, of course, in Brazil. And just to emphasize that the, you know, the training institutes are spread you know, in different parts of the large territory of the state. Uh, and because it's you know, in different parts of the state, the economic role uh, reality differs you know, from one area to the other. And we're gonna exploit this heterogeneity in our analysis. Admission uh, is only through lotteries in the, you know, in the years that we study here. Uh, uh, so in a given year, uh, one person, one applicant can only apply for one slot at a specific course in a specific training institute. Okay, but in the other year, the same applicant can apply again, okay? So there are some people applying, you know, um, many years, some of them apply just one, one year. Uh, the education department itself of the state government 
perform the randomization with uh, some partners, okay, and including auditing partners, and they created randomized waiting lists. So for each course, uh, suppose you have a thousand applicants, so they randomize the rank, okay, and if this course, if this this course ha has uh, 30 slots, the education department calls the 30 uh, people in the first positions. If you know some slot is available, uh, then the education department keeps you know calling uh, the other people from the waiting list until all slots are filled. In this paper, to be more precise, we work with two cohorts, okay, those who started the course in 2012, we were talking about a little bit over 100,000 applicants, okay, and we, uh, the second cohort started the course in March 2013, so the first one on March 2012, the second one on March 2013, and we we're talking about a little bit less of uh, 100,000 uh, applicants for the second cohort. Um, so just to, uh, I will skip a little bit just to, to emphasize one point, is that, you know, these two cohorts, they, they graduated at different moments of the business cycle, okay? So the first cohort, sorry, it's a little bit small here in the paper, it's bigger, uh, next time I have to, you know, to dedicate one slide for each uh, of these figures. Uh, let's go. Uh, so the first cohort, okay, uh, has, uh, you know, graduated before a recession period, okay, uh, in the state of Bahia. And the second cohort has graduated um, at the start of a recession period. Okay, and this, uh, we are uh, trying to use this fact to interpret, you know, the results that we we have from our regressions. I just to emphasize that the rules uh, of the lotteries are publicized, you know, you can enter the internet, the website. Uh, we said that we, so this uh, denotes the website of the education department. Uh, and it's one, it's one interesting fact is that, as I said, we, we didn't uh, carry out the lotteries. It was the department uh, of education uh, and the idea was to give uh, the same chance to, to every applicant. Okay, so they state this clearly here, okay, in this part. I don't know whether you can read it, but it's clearly stated here in this, in this part of the website. And the lotteries are widely publicized. Uh, so you can enter uh, the website. This is, a, this is a Facebook, they post on Facebook, okay, intensively to recruit applicants for the lotteries. So basically, uh, we, we use four registries in this paper to assess the impacts of the program. The first one is the Prosubi uh, registry. So we have the national ID of all members of the waiting lists. Okay, we know also which ones end up uh, enrolled, enrolling at one course and finishing that course. Okay, even though we have the national ID, uh, which is very important uh, to be precise on the merging with the other registries, uh, the uh, program registry doesn't have much info on personal characteristics. Okay, basically we have only gender uh, because the application form asks the national ID, the name, okay, and also like contact, uh, email contact, telephone contact, alternative email contact, so the education, uh, you know, department can reach, you know, winners. Uh, and so for all the applicants, we basically only have gender to use as, con as a control variable. Uh, so we merge with a RISE dataset, uh, which everyone knows. So just to be clear, for each cohort, we analyze six years up to six years after the lottery. So the first two years are during the course, okay? and then four years are after the course. We use a third registry from the Brazilian Internal uh, Revenue Service, okay, it's a public uh, data. Um, and so we know the, the, the identification of each owner, uh, firm owner in Brazil. So we create a dummy if the applicant has established a firm, okay, after 
after the lottery date, so zero one. We have also a registry for the uh, largest university in the state of Bahia, the Federal University of Bahia. And we also create a dummy, which equals one for those applicants who entered the university after the lottery date. Okay. Uh, so for uh, the RISE, we're going to be able to, to perform uh, analysis in different uh, moments of time. And we're going to perform cross-section analysis for entrepreneurship dummy, dummy and the university admission dummy. So the empirical strategy is quite simple. We uh, use the result of the lottery uh, to instrument for uh, enrollment dummy. Okay, and one uh, feature of the randomization is that naturally the education department created uh, strata, okay, different strata. Uh, so each strata is a, is a course and uh, site where site here is the location of the, of the uh, institution, uh, the, the, the educational institution, okay, and According to the implementers, this stratification relied on operational constraints of the program. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, here we can work with either or, uh, or both initial offer winners and ever offer winners. The initial offer winners are those winners, are those in the waiting list who are ranked up to the number of slots, okay, available for each course. And the ever offer winners are those called after, you know, if in the case uh, slots are vacant. Uh, so in this paper, I don't have much time to talk about this, but we must work with initial offer winners because we don't know whether, you know, everyone in the waiting list was called upon. We just know the ones that enrolled, but we know precisely who are the initial offer winners. So our instrument is based on initial offer. I don't have time to show the balancing analysis, but for the characteristics that we have, everything is uh, well balanced. Uh, so the lottery is created comparable groups. Uh, so the empirical strategy, uh, we want to assess the effects of enrolling at the course, okay, which is this dummy D, okay, and uh, we control for uh, gender basically, and a strata fixed effects, okay, and we instrument the uh, enrollment, enrollment dummy with our initial offer dummy. Um, so let's uh, talk quickly about the results. Do I have uh, four minutes? Three. Three minutes, okay. Um, so this is uh, comparing Winners and non-winners, we, you know, for the cohort one who have graduated, remember that we have two years of the course, so they have graduated here, okay? So what we find is that for the cohort one, you know, the effects of the program increases over time, even though, you know, there is a recession in the middle. When we separate for the impacts for female and male, we see that the female winners uh, suffer, uh, don't suffer much during the course, which may be because of low opportunity costs. Okay, we are trying to, you know, uh, go further in this analysis, uh, but we don't have much uh, to show now. Uh, but right after the, you know, the, the finish of the course, you know, female applicants, they present look, a quite stable five percentage point increase in employment compared to the control group. When we see the male students, results are strikingly different, okay? They, uh, they, they have a negative impact, okay? Right after finishing the course and they recover a bit, okay? But not that much. We have a small positive, but no, not significant uh, uh, increase six years after, you know, uh, the date of the lottery. So this is when we combine, you know, the impact, the effects for uh, male and female of cohort one, and for the, you know, year one, two, and three after the, the finishing the course, that is year years three, four, and five after the lotteries, 
these uh, uh, coefficients are, are different, okay, when we perform uh, the analysis. But in the last year, they are not statistically different. For uh, cohort two, who have graduated at the beginning of a recession period, okay, the overall impact is uh, very, very different. Uh, we, we see after six years that the, the impact are negative, but not statistically significant. Uh, uh, female students uh, do not present positive, uh, positive effects. Male students, they keep with a negative effect almost throughout, okay, the uh, years after the course. For instance, this one is significant at 10%, okay, but not significant at 5%. Uh, and these uh, figures, when we bo uh, put both cohorts together, uh, and then we see that the overall picture of the second cohort, sorry, it's a typo here, so the second cohort two, uh, the second uh, cohort uh, uh, suffer more uh, and don't present uh, the positive results of the first cohort. I don't have much time uh, to, as I expected, to go through the heterogeneity analysis, but this table is to show that courses in services, more specifically, non-health services are driving the positive results of female students of the cohort one, okay? And those female students of the cohort one who have positive, result, positive results are those uh, located at municipalities where the GDP uh, growth is above uh, the median. Uh, the last table of the paper show that there's, we find no impact on university, either university admission or entrepreneurship. And so this is the paper. Uh, uh, we, we still were planning to improve the paper. So any uh, comments are very welcome. Thank you. Okay, so we're out of, of time for questions. If anyone has any question, you can send it through the chat to Danielle. Enrique? No, he, I, I think he, he had the... the I okay. think it's an accident, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so... Can everyone see the presentation? Yeah. All right, so this, this paper is still a uh, work in progress, early stage, I would say. It's derived from my, my dissertation, master's dissertation. What I want to do is, is find if electing business people or candidates from business backgrounds for mayors in Brazil, if does influence the, the business environment of the, the city. And to do that, we use a progression discontinuity design. So uh, recently there's, there have been this intensively increasing number of, of politicians, of business politicians getting elected in the US, in Brazil, and in different levels in other countries. But in Brazil, in Brazilian case, uh, entrepreneurs are one of the most common occupations from candidates to, to, to city to mayor, for mayors. And this, the, there are mainly three ways that a, a mayor can impact the, the, how to say, the business environment of the city. It can be through fiscal incentives, although not much of the taxes are at the city level, but especially for service sectors, it, it does have, it, it can have, it has a space for, for doing that, for creating incentives. He can, the mayor can, uh, provide infrastructure like connecting roads, providing street lighting. In, in, in some cases, they can even build a uh, space for invite companies to the, their cities. And for most importantly, for bigger cities, the mayors have a power to decrease bureaucracy to open firms. In Brazil, it takes usually like 100 days to open a firm, and 30 to 40 days are related to documents and papers on the city level bureaucracy. Uh, 
uh, here is just some examples of ca candidates for, for mayors uh, promoting th this, this sort of a language, may, may this, this sort of candidates, these business people candidates, they promote themselves as good managers. And they usually say that they're going to bring innovation and, and they're going to decrease the bureaucracy, like this case of John Doria, who says he's, he'll diminish uh, times time to open a, a company in Sao Paulo from 100 days to one week. Uh, so these are some examples. And there is some evidence regarding the overall performance of business people, politicians. It's, the Beach and Jones, they find no evidence for electing business people in city, city councils in California, but they're looking at, at uh, fiscal, fiscal outcomes like revenues, city revenues and spending, and they find no, no effects. Blaschke is more related to my, my paper, our paper. It's he was looking at mayors in Brazil, and but his, his outcomes are also fiscal. And he finds no evidence of increasing in revenues or, or spending, but he finds a little, a small effect on increasing the transfers received from higher government, from uh, state and federal government. And there's this bigger literature that, that connects, relates companies and business, like the uh, companies that are related to politicians usually gain private uh, returns, but there, there is no, there isn't this gap in the liter literature about gains to other firms in general, not only the firms connected to the politicians. So to the best of our knowledge, we're the first to ask if, like what happens to the local, to, to the business environment, to the other companies and not just the companies connected to the, those politicians. <clears throat> and Brazil is an is interesting case because as I said, the number of mayors from business backgrounds is, is relatively high. And since 2016, corporate donations are prohibited for campaigns. So the value of holding office increased. A company is harder to elect someone uh, via funding. So it's better to just run for office themselves. And candidates may fund their own campaign. So a wealthy candidate may have incentive to run if his probability of winning is higher. So the, the data we use are from the 2008-2012 election, elections from the TSE. The firm related uh, outcomes are from highs, which is employer employee match their sets. Covariates are from the, the IPEA data in BGE. This, uh, these electoral data are not on votes, but they, they have characteristics on, on the mayors, on the candidates, and they have also the declaration of assets, which is important for the definition of a business person. Uh, another strategy is a simple RDD. Here, uh, M is the margin of the business person. B is the treatment. So we're looking for the effect of getting elected, uh, a businessman getting elected. <clears throat> this data too. And so this is uh, the two samples, the two definitions we have about a business person. The first was based on the, the work of Blaschke. He used uh, the self-report, candidates must report uh, what are their occupations when they are running. And some of them report themselves as entrepreneurs. And we use entrepreneurs and merchants, people that are more accustomed to the everydays of firms. And the other definition, which I think is stronger, is from the, the declared assets. I took a sample of 500 candidates and manually selected those who were uh, those who owned companies. And then I, using regular expressions, I tried to, to predict that, that, that variable, that indicator. It's not a perfect match yet. I'm still working, perhaps using machine learning to do that, but but uh, this this one used here has a high correlation, 0.92 or something. Uh, so we are using these two samples. This just summary statistics and balance tests for there, there's a slight problem for the the self-reported sample, which 
there is difference in gender in education. The candidates, business candidates from business backgrounds are usually less educated and more frequently male. But not the rejects one has no, not no, doesn't have this problem. But there is one one thing, like they are not really similar samples because as you can see, the population, the mean population of the rejects definition is almost double. And uh, also GDP, so uh, bigger cities with this sample here. But as a, so far, our main results are no results. There, there doesn't seem to be any effect at all on, on the net. Uh, this first outcome here is the, the net creation of firm jobs in level and in percentage terms. And this, this panel here for this, the self-reported sample and this one here for the reject sample. And no, no effects at all. And you can see that the, the number of effective observations is not small. So uh, I think that's more to zero than to poorly estimated. So here's the, the graphs for the firms and the employees. You see, there doesn't seem to be any discontinuity in any of these, as you can see. <clears throat> So uh, the other the other outcomes we look since we find no effect in the net number net creation of firms and employees is look at some of the labor force uh, labor market uh, variables like wages dismissals if there's anything happen at all and again at the aggregate at the city level we find nothing not with the self reported that started for the sample or, or the reject sample, <clears throat> this the same. Uh, so the next step was to separate firms by, by sector of activity. I separate firms in, into sorry, agriculture, industry and service, which are 95, 90 something percent of the companies, the total companies, and still there is no, no effect, there doesn't seem to be any, any effect at the city sector level if for neither of the, the, the samples, again. <clears throat> and the last, looking for heterogeneity, we separate cities by size, municipalities by size, because as it, uh, Brazil has 5,500 something, municipalities and they are very diverse in terms of size and GDP. So we separate by the median. I, I call towns the, the smaller cities, the ones with less, equal or less the median uh, population and cities are the greater than the median. And you can see that there are very different groups. And we run a, again everything to, to to see if there is any difference, if one of one of those types of cities could be having any effect, and we, there is no again no effect for 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 cities for big bigger cities, but for towns finally appears that may be something going on. So there may be heterogeneity heterogeneous effects. Uh, but just in small towns, it seems like there is decreasing number of industry, firms and employees, and maybe they're moving to service sector. <clears throat> this is the graphs for these small towns. Uh, and this for the employees in the small towns. As you can see, the, the service sector it does seem that have the, there's a discontinuity here. But industry, not so much, not that clear, but it does seem that maybe something here. Uh, and uh, the same for the same group for these small towns. Uh, I run again for these variables related to labor market. 
and, and again, there seems that there's something going on, but in agriculture uh, and just service, an industry service, which would be expected to have something because it's the one uh, losing jobs and firms has no effect. So we still to look at this heterogeneity yet, but uh, mainly, or mainly results at the aggregate level, we find we find there's no no evidence of, of effect, but we're still we're still looking for uh, for the next steps we're gonna still run. We're gonna to do is to we're gonna check the entry exit of firms using the identified version of highs. For this result so far, I haven't uh, I didn't have access to the identified version for technical problems, but we're gonna use it and test for firm entry exit. Uh, the definition of this person perhaps try to find a more accurate uh, definition with machine learning, like I said. Uh, we're searching for other formulated outcomes, like the number of days for, for uh, to open a company. If we can get that, it would be nice. We have, uh, we're working perhaps with a, a data set with judicial processes and stuff. And another uh, possible step was like we track candidates business records like the, the, the size of their companies the, the the sector they're in and stuff to see if they maybe the overall business business uh, environment will not change but he can make a, like a, promote the business and the other firms in the, the sector from the his background like a man from industry understands industry and promotes more companies, firms from his his type of business. So, to conclude here, we, there is no evidence. We find no evidence of overall effect in business environment. But estimates they differ depending on the the definition of the business person you use, and there may be heterogeneous effects which it will, we will look for in more detail. And if there are these heterogeneous effects that may be due to difference in the candidate's experience, as I said. So, thank you. Any questions? Here? How do I see it on the chat? Okay, so let's see the first question. Okay, there's a question here from, from Clayton. He asks, what, what is the proportion of candidates self-reported a businessman and non-businessmen in the data set? Uh, in the data set, I don't remember, but uh, it's, from person business candidates candidates and regarding all candidates i think it's eight percent seven percent something like that <clears throat> there any other questions i have a question um i was wondering whether you would look also at corruption or something like that because uh Probably in Italy, we were the forerunners in having politicians that were businessmen. And we see that most of, like the outcomes were that corruption increased a lot uh, where they were elected, while nothing changed. Probably because the day function of these persons are very different from the usual one of other politicians that are, have like party affiliations, etc. Uh, I, I couldn't hear something about corruption. One, can you repeat? Please? Yeah, I was wondering if you would like to explore also the link with corruption, given that you don't find many effects on uh, on the variables you are looking to. Um, since uh, in Italy, 
we had many businessmen starting getting to politics and mm -hmm. we observed that in general nothing changed in terms of public expense etc while corruption rose mostly uh, yes uh, well we don't look at corruption the, i think that this this association between uh, electing business person and private gains is kind of well documented i don't know what, exactly about corruption but we have no 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 outcomes nothing i, I don't think we we, we thought about uh, running stuff uh, trying to search for outcomes of, or uh, related to corruption stuff but uh I don't know. I think it's kind of Rubens, well just to mention, yes. just to mention that. So I'm I'm his co-author. So <clears throat> we might get something related to corruption when we link this data set with these um, these uh, judicial cases. So we have all this data set with this criminal um, suitcase that that might involve firms that are involved to this politician, this business, this business uh, guy that that is now the mayor. So we might get to this point that we get case by case, and we're gonna have some idea if uh, it's related to corruption at least. Thanks. Okay, so you have like two minutes. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, so how do we close up this? Rodrigo? Podemos encerrar a sessão? Ah, não Sim. Ok, obrigado a todos os apresentadores. Vamos encerrar a sessão, então. Muito obrigado, gente. Obrigado. Até mais. Muito obrigada, gente. Obrigado.